first uh, CERC seminar, uh, the S S Southeast Asia Research Center, for those of you who may be new to our talks. Um, we're very pleased uh, to, um, to, to kick off today with a, a very interesting talk by Dr. Sharon Wong uh, from our neighboring university, uh, Chinese U. But before I introduce Sharon, let me um, advertise our next talk, yeah, which yeah. is uh, just coming up in about uh, two weeks uh, by Dr. Sol Iglesias, who's a, a visiting affiliate at the National University of Singapore. And she'll be speaking on the origins of uh, the drug war in the Philippines, uh, President Duterte's so-called war on drugs in the Philippines. So I hope um, many of you uh, can join us. And if you know others interested, we'd be appreciate if you, you spread the word. Southeast Asia studies remains kind of a, uh, a niche uh, interest in, in, in uh, Hong Kong. So uh, please spread the word about our seminars. Uh, but without further ado, let me, um, let me introduce uh, Dr. Wong. Uh, as I said, very pleased uh, for her to have, usually I say, made the journey, uh, but in this case, the virtual journey uh, to, uh, to join us uh, today. Uh, and as you know, her topic is about Cambodia and China uh, with an archeological perspective. Um, let me briefly introduce uh, Sharon. She's an assistant professor at the Department of Anthropology at the Chinese University of Hong Kong with her research interests, including China, Southeast Asia, cultural interaction in the pre-modern period, and trade ceramic studies. She uh, did her PhD in Southeast Asian studies at the National University of Singapore and has undertaken field work in Southeast Asia as well as in China. She's currently working on a project about Khmer Chinese ceramics in Angkor uh, Wat in Cambodia and the Maritime Ceramic Road in Asia, very interesting as well. Um, she's authored a number of journal articles in uh, leading uh, journal publications in the field. And I should add in conversation with Sharon, I've discovered that in fact, uh, her backdrop today is not uh, the uh, uh, Angkor Wat as you might suspect, but rather uh, Vietnam, the Cham people, but uh, that's a topic for another CERC seminar, perhaps in the near future, Sharon. But in the meantime, thank you very much for joining us. And we look forward to, um, to your talk. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Mark. So uh, can I share my- uh, Please, uh, please do. Uh, my PowerPoint, okay. Okay, sure. Okay, let me make it a little bit bigger. So can you see that? And my son is, uh, uh, voice is enough. And I'm so happy uh, I can find my collaborator from uh, Upsar Authority and some of archeological uh, colleagues and different institutes uh, also uh, participate in uh, this talk. So uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation by Southeast Asia uh, Research Center, the City University of Hong Kong. And thank you so much for uh, Mark in introductions on me. So today um, I, uh, my presentation topic is Cambodia and China and archeological perspective. So um, I, uh, in particular, I would like to thank you, uh, my um, fund, funder uh, from LGCGLF. Uh, I um, newly uh, got funded uh, for this project. And I, I especially for my long-term uh, collaborator, the Upsar Authority from Simrip and uh, from Cambodia to have a vital support. And we have a long-term collaboration, uh, I think more than 30 to 15, 13 to 15 uh, years. So uh, this talk actually is modified uh, from my journal articles in collaboration with uh, Upsar Authority and uh, one has already published in Beijing Palace Museum Journal and other one is forthcoming, uh, hopefully uh, will be next month, uh, will appear in Asian Perspectives uh, with my colleagues, uh, 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 Dr. Ir Darif, um, Mr. Chai Rechina and uh, uh, His Excellency uh, Tan Bun Sui. And just want to show you, I think uh, most of you know it very well about the location of, sorry, this should not be like this. Oh, um, here, yes. Okay, so you can see that the location, it, it, I don't know why, yeah, maybe because of the, oh, okay, I keep on this here, China and Cambodia. So you can see the location and, um, in this talk, uh, I would like to investigate the Khmer ceramics production and its interactive relationship with China 
during uh, on Korean period um, uh, from the life to uh, 15th century in an archaeological perspective because I know uh, as uh, Southeast Asia uh, Research Center, actually most of the scholar focusing on contemporary Southeast Asia. So uh, this time I would like to uh, show you different perspectives on um, my research on how to study uh, Southeast Asia and uh, China uh, in archaeological perspective. So we may have a, a dialogue between that. And um, especially, I think um, quite a lot of you uh, have been to Cambodia, especially on call. So Angkor was the capital of uh, Khmer Empire in mainland Southeast Asia. Uh, it covered modern Cambodia, North Thailand, South Vietnam, Laos, and uh, Tanisarum of Myanmar. And it was inscribed on a World Heritage List in 1992. And uh, this Angkor National Park right now is under the management of Apsara Authority, and it also support by the UNESCO. Um, so they also have the ICC uh, uh, meeting uh, every year. Um, today, I would like to talk about uh, something very familiar, uh, but it's quite uh, strange uh, to all of us because maybe we use uh, the ceramic bowl every day uh, for eating rice or eat, eating salad or whatever. But actually, ceramics uh, is a pottery made from clay by the action of heat. And uh, why we study about that, especially for archaeologists, is because um, they are most uh, durable products in a large quantity from Southeast Asia and China and find among the maritime trade routes, especially between China and Southeast Asia. So it, it can be understood as the crucial source for the reconstruction of cultural contact between China and Cambodia during this period. So um, today my talk will, um, in general, talk about three questions, three research questions. First is to what extent did the contact um, the Khmer had with China motivated Khmer to begin um, ceramic production for local residencies and temples? And the second question is to what extent did the Khmer people make um, the technological and social choices as they embraced new uh, ceramic manufacturing technology? And finally, how does archaeology provide a new placing of Encore into the interregional trading networks of medieval Asia, especially right now we talk about contemporary Southeast Asia. Uh, we use a lot of efforts on the research on Baron and Road initiative uh, between China and um, Southeast Asia, in particular, the relationship between Cambodia and China. Um, I hope that uh, for this talk, um, uh, we can show like uh, a little bit, a little understanding uh, between these uh, two uh, country and between these two regions. So for the first question, um, I would like to uh, highlight that because um, when I studied in uh, National University of Singapore, most of my colleagues, they are studying contemporary Southeast Asia. It's, 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 uh, somehow it's quite very exotic uh, to talk with my colleagues, how um, can I study the people who already died in, um, in Cambodia? But basically, uh, if we use archaeological perspective, we use uh, various evidence to uh, talk about this topic. Um, as I show that in general is, um, for example, like the historical documents, uh, we really rely on it heavily and also the inscriptions. And second, it's very interesting because in China, uh, we usually use mural painting, but uh, in Cambodia, we usually study the base relief in Angkor area. And the third one, of course, the archeological findings in uh, Cambodia, other Southeast Asian countries, and also China. And the fourth is the ethno-archaeological investigation and finally the scientific testing, um, geochemistry and also the landscape archaeology to help us to understand um, Cambodia. Um, for the Cambodia in Chinese historical tests, um, uh, people uh, familiarly know it, especially in the pre-modern period, uh, it was the kingdom called uh, Chenna or Chenna, Chenna or Chenna, uh, which covered modern Cambodia, South Laos, uh, North East Thailand, also South Vietnam, and it lasts approximately uh, around the 6th to uh, 9th century. But its capital actually is not in Angkor, it's in um, Simbabwe, uh, right now in the Kampo Chong province of Cambodia. But during the Angkorian period, um, from 9th to 15th century, its name given to the time of Khmer Empire, which ruled a broad territory in mainland Southeast Asia. So you can see uh, its territory is covered larger than um, during the uh, Chenma period. It includes Cambodia, Northeast Thailand, South Vietnam, Laos, 
Tanisarams in uh, Myanmar, and its capital was in Angkor in Simri province in Cambodia. So um, I think you know it very well, but uh, just a very brief uh, introduction about Angkor is related to the Tamil Hindu king, uh, Jayawaman declared himself as God King. And Angkor in Sanskrit is called uh, Nagara, means both capital city in the state and also represent the kingdom and also the universe. So we always talk about Angkor Wat, actually uh, it's a part of Angkor. Um, it was a temple complex at Angkor and it was built um, for the King Sayaraman uh, II in the early uh, 12th century in his days as temple and also capital city. So in general, in Angkor, there's uh, many temples. Um, it also has the representation of mountain of gods and the central of Hindu and uh, Buddhist universe and the magic sanctuary of his uh, kingdom. So um, especially I want to uh, highlight is uh, Jayaraman uh, seventh. His Kamek king in the 12th to 12th, uh, 13th century identified himself as the Buddha Zava, an individual who has attained enlightenment and formed the Bayon temple and is a very important uh, period, especially during the Angkorian period. And later on, um, it was first fall under Ayutthaya in 14th century, and it was invaded back in the um, Kamek capital and finally it um, migrates to the Phnom Penh. So uh, I believe that um, most of you know it very well. But I especially want to um, check Chinese texts as the foreign source when we understand about the relationship between Cambodia and China. Uh, because most of my colleagues actually, they cannot uh, read Chinese very well and um, also the Chinese uh, archaeological material. So I in particularly, besides uh, the customs of Cambodia, I want to highlight the importance of the Song Hui Yao Zi Gao, the uh, Song government manuscript, uh, the compendium. And other tests we uh, between these two regions on their maritime interaction. Um, for um, in and later on, I will talk about that. But especially for the custom of Cambodia, it's quite obvious uh, by the uh, Chinese diplomats. I believe that is the first Chinese diplomat. They have he has a, a real participant observation in on call for almost one year. Uh, he called Chiao Ta Guan. And his account, um, his account is of great uh, historical significance and uh, only the survival first person written the record of daily life in the Khmer Empire. In particular, in uh, one of um, his chapters, um, he mentioned about the Chinese goods most in demand, uh, especially he talked about the um, ceramics from Quanzhou, and, and Quanzhou was a very important international port during the Song Yuan period uh, from Fujian province and also Chuzhou uh, is uh, Zhejiang province. And it also has an important port called uh, Limbo. Uh, at that time it's called Minzhou uh, at that time. So um, this is a very important reference for us. But for Zhong Hui Yao Zi Gao, uh, it also helps us to understand more about um, uh, uh, chi uh, China and Cambodia. So let's take a look. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, to talk about the human uh, mobility, migration, and also uh, the object falls, and why people went to, especially uh, the Khmer went to China, and how uh, Chinese went to Cambodia. For example, like uh, in the test uh, in the Lawton Song period, actually, um, it mentioned that um, there were uh, two Khmer merchants. They uh, crossed the border from Angkorian area to uh, Zhaozhou and then Gaozhou and then uh, to Guangzhou by land and sea. And their purpose uh, was running the business. So this is one of the evidence. And the second evidence is um, it mentioned the Jenna ambassador, um, probably is the Khmer uh, people. Um, this, um, he, uh, they went to Kaifeng, the capital of uh, Song Court uh, in the Lawton Song period, and uh, they transport the Chinese ceramics from Limbo port to Simrip. But this time, their purpose is a little bit different, is uh, pay the tributes and also discuss the business with the Chinese. So actually, we can see from the test, um, Khmer also went to uh, China. And Limbo, uh, I mean, Mingzhou is uh, a very important place to purchase ceramic to give uh, to the Khmer mission. Uh, and and other uh, Chinese text called Gong Gui Zi uh, by Liu Yu uh, is uh, in the Southern Song period. It also talk about the uh, human mobility. In particular, they are also called Jana, but actually it's the Angkorian uh, big merchants. 
um, he or she moved um, from uh, the Ontarian area to Quanzhou by the sea. But what did he uh, sell is the selling the beeswax to China. So we can see that uh, actually it has a very clear um, uh, product name uh, for this object and the Kamei uh, merchants, they have um, the discussion and meet up the people. And they, um, the Kamei stay at the big ports during the Songyun period with his four, four ships and two ships as a wife and other two were uh, intercepted by the Chinese officials. So um, in, in different tests, they also mention about BUS again, and also the uh, fabrics uh, from Jianlin, probably in um, uh, Fuzhou area. And uh, actually from the archeological information in uh, Fuzhou, um, we also find uh, a very famous Fujian textile from uh, Huang Sun tomb uh, in, uh, at the site. So um, we can understand more, it's quite, uh, you know, uh, popular for us to talk about the relationship between Cambodia and China, in particular on the human mobility and the object both. So how can we connect uh, the archaeological evidence and the historical accounts between Cambodia and China? This is what we are looking for. But at the same time, I would like to incorporate um, the um, theoretical frameworks uh, from uh, anthropological archaeology, especially the teleological and social choices to highlight such mobility of Khmer's and also the object flow during the Angkorian period. Because I find that actually they, um, their interaction are very complex. Um, from the test and even from the archaeological data, you can see that they have obvious interaction and the roads uh, from uh, Angkor um, to, for example, like Guangzhou, Chenzhou and Limbo is appear again and again uh, in the Chinese test. And we also find the evidence from uh, archaeology. But I would especially uh, want to uh, highlight another very important information about Chinese diplomats. Uh, maybe for the contemporary researchers on um, Cambodia, uh, they may ignore the importance of the record of Zhou Da Guan, especially uh, from his travel route through the sea in the 13th century. Um, is he starting his route from Limbo, Zhejiang, and Wanzhou? And right now we know that Wanzhou is a very uh, prosperous and um, uh, many businessmen, they went to Southeast Asia. But in the ancient time, they also did that. And um, I believe that um, this part should be a very important um, angle for us to understand more about the um, diplomacy between Chinese and Cambodia. Because for Zhou Daguan as the Chinese dip uh, diplomat, at that time, he also traveled through this area to Angkor, uh, through Champa. Okay, so Champa uh, uh, at the back of this is Meifeng. I would like to say that is uh, a very important entry port uh, to go into Angkor. So I just give you some idea about that. And from the inscription, uh, the Kamet inscription and also the Sanskrit, um, for example, like in uh, Perkan Temple in Angkor, uh, actually it's obviously record that Chinese imported objects. In particular, they uh, mentioned 520 bosses. So an other inscription, it also mentioned that they find the uh, Chinese um, uh, import goods for 500 bosses. Although the inscription did not mention the material of Chinese bosses, but based on uh, the archaeological discoveries by different international archaeological team in Angkor National Park, it's quite obvious we find a big numbers of Fujian De Hua white ceramic board shirts in Perkan uh, area they may probably use as the container related to ritual purposes or religion. So it's quite obvious. And another evidence is for the base relief. You can see that um, they also have the cover boxes here, although we don't know the nature, but probably it may be made by metal or by ceramics. But you can see that they uh, obviously they have the ritual practice on this, so it can help us a lot. And and I love to visit Bayon Temple again and again because it's so fantastic for their base relief. And another very popular topics for the contemporary uh, Southeast Asian studies is about the Chinese diaspora. But again, if we study in the modern period in Cambodia, especially the base relief. We can see that um, uh, the Chinese is quite identical. They have the hair, they, they make it like this, uh, like a ball at the back. They love eating. 
so they cook food, uh, cook food and eating food in front of the Khmer house. And also in Chow Da Guans, the custom of Cambodia also have um, the information talking about the Chinese diaspora. They want business and how did they live uh, in Angkor. Not just Chow Da Guan, but um, uh, quite a number of Chinese diaspora they already settled in our uh, Angkor area. So you can see they use uh, the cooking utensil to cook their food. And for the archaeological evidence, uh, in particular in um, the Angkor National Park, uh, you can see here um, in the Lovin Library of Myron Temple, they find many uh, cover boxes shirts like this. And um, according to our investigation, we believe that it may use to uh, contain the beeswax or uh, other objects uh, for the ritual practice or religion purpose. This is one of the um, uh, assumptions about that. And um, based on uh, my previous study uh, from my PhD uh, research, uh, we find um, the Chinese ceramics widely distributed in the Angkorian area, especially inside um, the Angkorian National Park. So it can help us to understand, actually, for both Khmer and Chinese ceramics, they are um, closely linked up together on this. Yes, already have question on that. Okay. So here are some information, but uh, quite obviously we find Khmer ceramics more than Chinese because obviously uh, the Chinese ceramics is um, a little bit smaller, but for the Khmer ceramics, they are larger and uh, they usually have a bigger container and also utilitarian wear. But for the Chinese ceramics, um, they are small light boxes, um, things a, a little bit smaller and more delicate. And um, we can find some things from uh, Zhejiang, as I mentioned, in Ningbo, the uh, transportation in Wenzhou. And even we also can find the Chinese object, in particular ceramics, um, in the early period, um, in around the uh, 10th century. And also the Dehua, um, and, and more important, Zizhou. Because Zizhou actually is located to Jinjiang, very close to the international port of Quanzhou. So uh, when we're looking at uh, this uh, object, we should take a look on the uh, import of uh, the Chinese products from uh, Qingzhou area. So it's another um, uh, ceramics from the Jiangxi province, in particular uh, from the Jingdezhen Qiong. And um, because we can see the Chinese ceramics, so how did um, Kamet Porter think about that? Did they receive the knowledge through imported Chinese ceramics? Actually, when um, I compare with the Khmer and Chinese ceramics based on the top topological analysis, I find that um, it's uh, not difficult to find um, some of the shapes and also the decorative methods uh, um, can find in the Khmer ceramics. They are directly copied from uh, Chinese ceramics. So actually, we can find some evidence about that. But the next question is, to what extent the Khmer people uh, make technological and social choices as they embrace the new manufacturing technology. Because in um, Chinese narratives, especially the Barry and Roe initiative, um, the researchers always emphasize the Chinese influence to Cambodia. But actually, uh, in my research and my participant uh, observation, I believe that uh, Khmer take a very active role and active they are the active agent on making their own choice to choose uh, which Chinese elements they would like to absorb or and also uh, on their manufacturing technology. They are not just receive uh, the um, Chinese technology passively. And I will tell you why. But at the beginning, I want to give you a very brief uh, introduction about um, the concept on the social and technological choices. Um, because when we understand that, we uh, can see that uh, it's an extensive social and environmental context of local perceptions and its possibility of borrowing external technical features in a specific area. And most important is continu continuing evolving as a mixture of conservatism and change in the technical system. So they are not absolutely absorb all Chinese elements and passively receive Chinese influence on that. And the technological choices uh, on ceramic studies, many researchers uh, did it, uh, especially the Lemoniate and um, um, some uh, researchers, they also modify this uh, in 
uh, the Shim of Tua. So I uh, will not talk about it uh, too detailed. But um, besides these theoretical frameworks and also conduct the ethno-archaeological investigations, I in particularly um, um, visit uh, some of the villages uh, in uh, Tamil uh, village, and I want to know uh, how did the contemporary people think about that, and how do they think about the technology uh, from the outside world. And uh, I have a chance to visit uh, Tamuchinant in Cambodia. It's a most famous pottery port uh, from uh, 90 uh, kilometers from Phnom Penh. And it's also along the river bend, um, along the Tony Sat Lake. It's uh, located, you can see that uh, it's almost in the middle of Cambodia. And uh, why I conduct this research? Because um, based on Zhou Ta Kwan's uh, test, it's very obviously that they have the hierarchy between uh, the officials and the common people. The officials uh, or the royal court and also the kings, they usually use the metal, in particular gold and also silver uh, uh, as their utensil for eating, drinking and storage. But for the common people, um, they mainly use ceramics or even the earthenware or the cocoa husk or Chinese ceramics. Um, for their daily life as the utilitarian wear for cooking wise, uh, serving wise, and other purposes. And other most important evidence is about the base relief and the ceramic finds in Encore. So you can see that Chinese appear again uh, for cooking. And at the same time, we can see the base relief for the Khmer people, they produce their own ceramics. So it can help us a lot to understand about um, how the people use uh, this object and how did, the, uh, did it relate to the common people. And um, when I uh, visit my friend, when I uh, live in Cambodia, I find it's very interesting for the custom because during the wedding, they usually uh, use the gold and silver replicas uh, in the in important ceremony, for example, like wedding. And when they have a worshiping ceremony, um, related to Buddhism, they also use the earthenware and also the ceramic. And they also transport the um, ceramics uh, by using the ox cot. And of course, uh, in the tourism spots, we can also find some uh, ancient pots they sold uh, in the store. So you can see that uh, it's in their everyday life, they use the uh, ceramics. But interestingly, when I uh, live in the village, I find that uh, for the Khmer local people, they use both new and old method altogether. The old method is by using open firing. Um, then the new method is kiln firing. Uh, they are toyed and torched by the NGO people. And um, if in their old method, they use the pedal and Enfield method. And if they learn it from the outsider, uh, they use the real flowing. But they can use it together in the same household. So it's very interesting for me. So when I incorporate the ceramic theories and also the ethno-archaeological investigations, I find that actually porters have their own four choices. They keep on the conservatism on using the old method, but they, uh, some of them may give up uh, the new method and continuously use the old method as they realize that there is something new. Someone uh, taught them something new and they, uh, imp they may be inspired by the in import uh, Chinese ceramics. And the third choice is that you use both and finally use only new method. And I interviewed um, several uh, porters and they, give, uh, they gave me some uh, reasons of the choices. Um, I summarized them uh, for several reasons, but I want to emphasize that this inter interview is based on the contemporary Cambodia. Um, the first is about the economic return uh, for the small and medium ports can bring more money than the big ports. Uh, especially from the tourists. They can pay more and buy their product, products. And second, they consider the porters' accessibility of new technological skills. Because, for example, like glazing, wheel flowing method were taught by the local institutes. And they also told me, um, like uh, Japanese, um, the Dutch, and also Thai people, they also uh, went into the village and they have a chance to study some new methods. And also some young people, they went to Phnom Penh and then they received the certificates uh, on um, learning some new methods on um, making the ceramics. So it's, um, it's ba also based on whether they can assess these new technological skills. And the third one, 
is more important is whether the porters they are their acceptance on the new technological skills, because intentionally, uh, many foreign NGOs workers they want to solve the poverty problems on the village. So um, they go to the host country for the soft term cultural and technological exchange. But um, they can inspire them something. For example, like uh, this uh, drum. Uh, actually, uh, this porter, she had a chance went to US. But um, but actually, she just learned um, a very few types of this. But finally, she keep on using um, the uh, old method to produce her own ceramics. And so it depends on um, the width and also the depth of the infants, which must match then um, the teaching or inspiring by the local people. So, um, but uh, in my experience on the if, if no archaeological research, it's very interesting that uh, for the ceramic productions, they usually uh, have uh, the experience on the localization process, especially for the potters, they learn the real following, but at the same time, they have their functional pottery designed by the local potters. So it inspired me a lot uh, when I study um, the archaeological findings in Onko area because I all my uh, potential informants uh, were died. Um, and when I studied uh, the ceramics production sites here, so just show you, um, there's a many uh, cubes right now already excavated by absolute authority. Especially, uh, I was invited by uh, Mr. Um, Chai Ratchler. I have a chance to uh, join the uh, excavation in Bakoku, excavation in 2015. So um, we have a chance to excavate many new uh, artifacts uh, in uh, this time. So you can see we uh, find a lot of uh, ceramic shirts um, on that. And when we compare with uh, the Chinese and Khmer ceramics, uh, obviously um, they have learned some of um, the uh, method, for example, like trimming, water replenishing, we compare on that, and also glazing. It's, it's obviously quite different when we study in detail on step by step on the sequence on the ceramic production and the um, kiln firing. Uh, it seems like they borrow some, for example, like the coarse draft. Uh, kiln structure, but um, obviously they make their own choice. So when we compare on uh, the stacking wreckage and also the stacking method step by steps, we find that it's quite different. But uh, we can see uh, still, for example, like the decoration is quite obvious. They they absorb they make the choices to absorb some of uh, the motifs or the form the forming methods or the carving design. Um, so, um, in my two case studies, uh, I want to uh, show you something more about uh, how uh, do archaeologists study uh, the relationship between China and uh, Cambodia in archaeological perspective. And I want to, uh, in uh, my final, uh, final part, I would like to show you two examples. One is cover the process, especially the findings in Bako uh, excavation. So uh, here are some location and we also uh, combine with the tamaric cube sites together here. And we find some so-called choline, the white uh, clay uh, in this area. So actually they have the source on producing ceramics. And here um, are the, um, the location of the excavation sites. And here are some of the findings from our excavation. And uh, this finding, you can see that, uh, for example, like this bird shaped cover box, and these lotus petals, and also these stacking methods. When we compare with uh, the site from uh, Zhejiang, as I mentioned, that in Ningbo and also Wenzhou area, actually they have a very important kiln called Yue Kiln. It's very close to uh, the Hangzhou area. Um, when I compare with the material, this is what uh, my uh, investigation in 2018. You can see that they, um, the glaze uh, was very fine, and you can see some of the shapes can uh, find also in Khmer. And when I compare with the findings uh, in China, especially South China, and the findings in uh, Onko area, you can see that especially these first shape cover boxes is easily find in uh, many uh, export kilns in uh, China. So here is um, some examples on the comparison from uh, my PhD dissertation. And more important, as I mentioned, in the base relief, 
uh, it's so popular for uh, the Khmer people, they use the cover the boxes. But for the Chinese, uh, most of the kilns, uh, most of the production site, they find bolts rather than boxes. So they have uh, uh, strong uh, preferences on using copper boxes. They have their big needs on that. Um, uh, how do Khmer people, uh, uh, why they use this kind of things? Maybe they uh, try to attempt to distinguish their products from imported items, especially for the ceramics, to maintain their special uh, traditions. And they intentionally know that uh, Chinese import ceramic would have represent a new element in Khmer society. However, uh, for the Khmer uh, people, they obviously they have impact on that. But for the Khmers, they realize that between China and Khmer, they have a big gap between their technology. So they make their own choice. And another reason is obviously for the exchange, we can divide it into the official exchange, in particular the tributes, and also the folk exchange on the influx of Chinese ceramics in um, uh, on core national part. It may simulate the technological innovation of a Khmer ceramic industry. And, uh, and from our archaeological findings compared with Chota Kwan's observation, we can say that actually uh, both world courts and also common people, they also use ceramic, but not just the world court mainly use uh, the metalware for the gold and silverware. So um, we can understand that maybe for the Chinese ceramics, uh, they may be treated as the prestige item mainly find in on Korean region, but we need to uh, study more on that. Another very important case study is the roof tiles. Um, this is this roof tile we can um, easily find it cover on the top of the building and provide the um, the roof protection. And we find a very interesting finding because before encore period, the Q, uh, the Khmer roof tile actually is the fat tile. And most of the French uh, scholar, they believe that actually this tile uh, was under the influence by India. But in the Angkorian period, the Khmer roof tile, it totally changed the shape. And they believe that it incorporated the Chinese influence. So you can see that we are still in the, you know, big narratives between Southeast Asia is it between China and India. So we are in the, it seems like in the cost world. But when we actually look into that by the comparative um, perspectives, we can see that for the Khmer roof tile, actually, if they have glaze and change the shape like Chinese, it appeared since ninth century. It's somehow related to the maritime trade road um, starting from China to Southeast Asia and, and for rising in the Songyun period. And they have four type primary types uh, of the um, roof tile. And in particular, why they have the roof tile is obviously they mainly use in the royal palace, the royal family hall and related to royal family and also the religion, religious structure, for example, like temple, but not for the common people. And also in the base relief, it also indicate that most of this ceramic roof tile were being placed over the wooden beams. But for Chinese roof tiles actually appear in long time ago during the West Zhou period. And for the Chinese roof tile, they have many um, types and the shape is quite different from the Khmer one, but um, they have a very special shape called the tile M and the jib tile. So let me show you the picture. Um, maybe next time, if you have a chance to uh, go to the Chinese Civilization Center in City U, uh, you can see they also have the Chinese roof tile, but obviously they use it to jib the water and compare with the Khmer one, they have a quite obvious, we call that female on top of it. So actually they um, change the style, but they are not necessarily absorb all the Chinese um, style of um, the roof tile to um, their uh, the roof tile production. And quite obviously they try to simplify it uh, on the roofing compared with the Chinese one. And uh, when I compare with uh, our archaeological findings between Khmer and Chinese, you can see that uh, in detail, their tiles, style, and the decorative method is quite different. Here is another one, especially the one tile. And also the rich tile, and you can see that um, they have this kind of uh, tile and 
but we cannot find it in Cambodia. So uh, when uh, in in general, I try to make this like a uh, uh, map, uh, like the table for you. Uh, you can see that actually, if we um, uh, studied by the production sequence and the traditions, obviously, uh, Khmer people, they make their own choice on the ceramic production. But why I would like to highlight this, uh, on, especially on the roof tile, because uh, it's a very symbolic material um, uh, objects to understand the relationship between China and Cambodia. Two factors uh, could have simulated a social economic needs for technological innovation of Khmer ceramic production. First, it's related to the population pressure so, um, due to the territory expansion of Angkor Empire, in particular in the Surawaman uh, the first during the 11th century, is um, around the time um, on um, building um, the Angkor uh, most important um, um, building. And a, a very important point is about the shift, the state religion from Hinduism to Buddhism. So roof tile being used as the material symbols of the um, concentrate, um, concentralize political and also the religious power. So as uh, we understand the forbidden city in uh, Beijing, why um, the Chinese, um, uh, the king, the courts, they take a big effort on building the uh, roof tiles and also the bricks and they take a big effort on building or restoring the forbidden cities. That's all related to the central political and religious power. From the materiality is a very important material symbols, but uh, for most of the time, um, researchers usually ignore that. And the second reason is increasing this for the ceramic products as a medium of exchange. In particular, the establishment of the Khmer polities, uh, diplomatic and economic relationship with China was maintaining through the provision of tribute and trade. But it can interrelate it on the official and also the folk exchange. But we can understand it um, in detail about that. But when we go back uh, into what I talked about, the Song Hui Yao Zi Gao again, so you can see that um, we know that there are some changes uh, between the um, central in China, in particular, they shift uh, the Kai Fung uh, to um, the Lin An place. Um, they also change um, the uh, trading port uh, from Guangzhou uh, to Chenzhou. So uh, when we understand that, uh, we should uh, take in mind that in Song Hui Yao Zi Gao, in particularly, they mentioned during the, um, in, uh, the 12th century, the 1110, zeros, uh, they have uh, obvious records on the exchange increase during the reign of Surawaman II. And the Chinese ceramics were important into uh, the Angkorian wing, uh, region during this time. But uh, for most of our researchers um, studying uh, Cambodia in archaeological perspective, they may not take a look on this uh, text and this evidence. And second is the intensive inter-regional trade on the port change from Guangzhou and Hangzhou to Chenzhou. Um, they continue and uh, they uh, have also have another form of exchange between Khmer polity and China until the mid 15th century. So um, I can say that this potentially provide the social and technological networks related to ceramic production that would have facilitated the Khmer, um, I will use a word, I think about how to make it this um, emulation of Chinese craftsmanship, but they made their own choice on that. So um, in conclusion, um, I would say that for Chinese tradition, uh, traditions and style has an impact on Khmer roof child production and also ceramic production during Angkorian period. Quite obviously, they produce um, the base tile and change to the shapes of curve and flat tiles during the Angkorian period. But we, when we compare with the complicated structure of Chinese wooden architecture, uh, with, uh, because wooden architecture um, was the soul of Chinese architecture. But for the Khmer, it seems like they use more simpler, localized, and more thematic building method for um, their um, construction uh, projects. And when the Khmer contact with China may have motivated the production of tiles for elite um, Khmer residents and also the temples, and they also manufacturing on using the roof tile were a way for the Khmer to establish 
the legitimacy of the policy in mainland Southeast Asia. As I mentioned, during the Encore period, period they cover a many places, many nowadays countries in mainland Southeast Asia. So for the Khmer, um, they will involve the important policy other than China, but we should take a look on Cham and Javanese peoples providing the alternative mode for Khmer architecture and construction technology. So this one, that's why I put uh, Maison at, at the back of my uh, wallpaper. I, yeah, I would emphasize that um, it's a very important point for us to understand more about um, the mediator, I can say, maybe uh, the agent in between uh, China and uh, Onko may getting involved by uh, Cham and also Japanese people. And uh, roof tiles is a very important and critical indicator for Khmer imperial expansion. And it can give us an entry point for understand the extent to which the Khmer made the decision to embrace the new um, ceramic manufacturing uh, technology, in particular, the Chinese cultural practices and the architectural materials. So um, when I, uh, in conclude, uh, compare with the contemporary Southeast Asian studies and um, the pre-modern Southeast Asian studies between uh, Cambodia and China, I would like to say that material culture and also archaeological remains can provide us a new understanding um, on the complex uh, relationship between Southeast Asia and China that uh, for the researcher, we may take a look on it. So that's all for my presentation. And, um, and in particular, I would like to thank you, APSO Authority, for their um, unfailing support for uh, my research and uh, long-term collaboration with them, and also uh, many of my colleagues um, working in Cambodia and elsewhere in Southeast Asia and China. Thank you. Thank you. Plenty of time for questions. And I see there's already one question uh, via chat. But uh, Sharon, I think it's easiest in this uh, format for you just to field your own questions. and. I, to the audience, uh, you know, please feel free to either use the raise hand function or 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 to send your question to Sharon by the uh, the chat function. So uh, um, again, Sharon, it's uh, I'll, I'll leave it to you uh, for now to to, to navigate these uh, the, the discussion. Thank yeah, you. sure, sure. Thank you, Mark. Um, so I see one question from uh, Valentina. Uh, how can we distinguish in the base relief and Chinese people and Hiren Du and Kofeng? Yes. Uh, yeah, actually many researchers, um, they did conduct the uh, study on that and it's quite obviously, okay. Uh, let me try to show you. Uh, many researchers, not me, I think uh, the um, Cam uh, Cambodian scholar and the French scholar, they also did a lot of research on the base relief. And it's quite uh, obvious to distinguish, yeah, here. Yes, so you can see that uh, it's quite obvious. Maybe my colleagues can explain some for uh, Mr. Wachima. Uh, you can see that it's, uh, from this picture, you can see uh, their hairstyle and uh, the decorative on their earring. Uh, you can see it's very obvious they are Khmer people. But for the Chinese here, okay, so you can see that they have uh, this uh, hair style at the back of that. But for the Chan people, they have an other style is quite uh, distinctively identified that they are Chinese or Khmer. So I hope that I can answer you uh, the questions, but uh, there's a long-term uh, research by uh, French and uh, Khmer and also Western scholars uh, in particular on the base relief. I would recommend you to uh, read uh, a uh, book uh, called Bayon. Yeah, Bayon. And it's talk about the base relief in Encore in detail. And you can um, study more about uh, different people, Chinese diaspora, and different group of people on studying on that. And, and other, yes, and, and COVID also. Yeah, many, many researchers conduct their research related to their clothings and hairstyle, whether they have a uh, hammock on that and um, the, uh, how do they wear the clothes and um, um, how, the, how do people affiliate together and their association. Yeah, I hope that I can uh, answer your question. Yeah. Oh, okay, sure. Oh, Bayon, Bayon. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah, you, you can just find it there. Okay, so another question. Okay, thank you. So any other question? And I, I'm quite curious about um, how do uh, um, you guys think, especially um, when you're studying the contemporary Southeast Asia, I want to learn more about you. Yeah, it's a, it's a good chance for us to have a dialogue right. between well, the contemporary Southeast. Because, yeah, I always come across uh, with how can we, you know, have a real dialogue between people studying uh, like anthropology. Uh, yeah, I, I with my colleagues, um, they study anthropology in Southeast Asia and even South, South Asia or Indian Ocean. And um, um, sometimes they don't know what we are doing and uh, how can we have collaboration together? Yeah. If, if I may, uh, Sharon, just as we're waiting for other people to collect their okay, thoughts. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, I mean, the one thing that of course occurs to me already uh, mentioned it in passing, um, you know, how this kind of relates to current concerns. And obviously uh, one uh, that's of interest in what, to students of contemporary politics is the very close ties today between Cambodia and China. In fact, if one could single out a single member of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, uh, which is closest to China, I think most people would agree it's Cambodia. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> and uh, the South China Sea controversy and, and a number of other things, also the extent of Chinese investment and so on. And you mentioned Belt and Road and, and so on. So I think, you know, the, the interesting thing is how history gets told in a way that, you know, it, it is framed in a way that, that, that benefits this narrative. And I would imagine both the Cambodian government, which, of course, faces some pushback from its own population on these close ties, Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, and 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 uh, you know, would would want to emphasize Cambodian autonomy despite its in close interactions with China. Uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, of course, uh, China wanting to be seen as uh, as a provider of of you know important technological goods to Cambodia, but uh, also probably uh, would uh, would be happy to say, well, of course, it's adapted locally. So I, I, this is a very long. Uh, winded way of saying, uh, I think your research uh, findings in a sense would be uh, politically um, convenient for, for, for these both sides uh, viewed from that perspective. I mean, that's just a uh, kind of a thought experiment I just made. Oh, okay, Mark, I understand. <laughs> I understand what you mean. Um, frankly speaking, uh, at, um, for me, because I received my training, my archaeological training in mainland China, in uh, Peking, so I uh, understand that uh, when I first um, start my uh, Southeast Asian studies in Singapore, I realized that I'm very I'm a sinologist. But later on, when I getting you know indulging in Cambodia and then I know the people and work with them, I think that I realized that I should not be too sinologist to think to see things because they only have usually have one narrative is Chinese infants, Chinese infants on Cambodia. But actually, when I study the text, and um, uh, you, you can see that I use different evidence um, to uh, all my research. And uh, when I talk to the people, and it's quite obviously they make their own choices. Even uh, while now I start my research in Vietnam, um, the same. And uh, because I also have a chance to uh, stay with the Chinese team, uh, the uh, CAS, the Chinese um, team, um, they were working the conservation work in our own core and I have a chance to stay with them. So I, I can learn from them and I could talk to them. And um, it's quite obviously they treat it as a duty for the diplomatic re uh, reasons on um, the conservation in the Encore National Park. But at the same time, they really want to um, support the Cambodian government. So um, I can say that I, I'm in between. Sometimes I'm the outsider, but actually I'm the insider uh, because of my um, I can say that uh, the identity politics also um, let me think about uh, yeah whether it's really convenient to say something, but uh, I seldomly use Chinese inference this term um, on uh, my studies. I will I will treat it in between, and I will think about that uh, actually both of the sides they have um, their uh, they they take the active role on. Um, receiving something or at lowering something, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 if I could just add, Sharon, I, I absolutely agree with that, and I think that um, you know you point to another important issue, which is 
the, the one of the grave challenges so-called area studies faces because mm. those of us who study Southeast Asia, uh, although of course cannot by any means ignore China, uh, particularly in contemporary politics, but also in, in, in as you say, pre-modern politics. Uh, nonetheless, our specialty is, you know, based on our training and so on and language competence and, and, and other issues. Um, but, you know, I think that is the, the, the way you've done this uh, to, to, to approach it from both sides, to, to look at also the comparison of, of these things and, uh, and then compare it to other places where you've had Chinese influence and see how that influence is played out there. I think that's uh, a way forward and, uh, and a way away from some of the insularity Mm. Of 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 Asia, various studies, be it you know China studies or or Southeast Asian studies. So I think that uh, that part of your research is, uh, is is very promising and 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 challenges all of us to to to, to do more of this. Mm. Yes, thank you, Mark. I hope some of our more sure. expert friends will. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I see oh. there. Yes, uh, Sharon. Can, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yep, yeah, my name sure. is Tom Patton. I'm also from City University of Hong Kong, one of Mark's uh, colleagues. Really fascinating presentation. One thing I wanted, to, I, I found it interesting that you as an archeologist uh, are in anthropology department. And so methodologically, I'm interested in how you are using your, your, your study of the contemporary areas to kind of look back and reflect upon your archeological findings. So just methodologically, I'm wondering I find that fascinating. I'm just wondering if you could just tell me a little bit more about that. Um, so, uh, sorry, uh, can I chime in? Because I, my question actually follows Tom's uh, questions. Okay, sure. Sorry. Uh, hi, uh, this is June. I've been to your talk before in the Hong Kong Anthropological Society. Uh, I think we talk after the talk before. So I don't know whether I actually make the same questions. I asked the same question before. You mentioned you use uh, ethnography, uh, you do field work to mm -hmm. assess your um, uh, archeological analysis. However, if I remember correctly, so correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. you mentioned at the beginning of the talks that your research focused on the 8th century to 14th century. Uh, so, 9 to 15th century. 9 to 15, yeah. So, and then from 15th century to contemporary, there's six centuries differences. So a lot of things could happen in that long period of time. So if you're doing ethnographic fieldwork, trying to observe and ask people how they know, how they feel, how they make sense of the use of pottery or ceramics in the contemporary setting, maybe a lot of things have already shifted in the 600 years. How can you build a valid connections between the contemporary fieldwork and the material culture at least the material artifacts that you have collected um, in archaeological uh, investigation. Mm, okay, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Zhang Jin and Tom. Uh, a very good question. So, um, for the ethnoarchaeological methods, is uh, one of the uh, methods I use, as I mentioned in the evidence, is one of the methods for me to uh, treat it as a references references, not the crucial uh, materials that I use. The crucial materials is um, the historical text and inscriptions, base relief and archaeological findings. Yes, this is our crucial uh, study. But for the ethno-archaeological uh, study, as I mentioned in the customs, uh, because in Cambodia, uh, if you have a chance to visit the village, right now they are still using um, a lot of earthenware um, in the ancient time, compared with uh, in the uh, base, uh, this base relief, they are they are still keeping the traditional very well. Compared with Hong Kong, yeah, because I also study the traditional ceramics uh, in contemporary Hong Kong. But for the Cambodia, they when they produce the earthenware, um, the production sequence it can give us a very good reference references for us to understand more about during the ancient time. But for the ethno-archaeological studies, we uh, have two components. One is um, studying the people, how do they uh, make um, the pottery? And the second is the experimental archaeology. So this is the major reference for me to think about the potter, potter's choices. But my um, crucial references is based on the ceramics theory, uh, on the technological choices or stream of poire. 
rather than the ethno-archaeological methods, but just for me as a uh, references. So you, your question is really good. How can we link up with um, the ancient uh, production method with uh, the contemporary methods? It depends on uh, how do we compare the society and understand the environment and um, the basic uh, economic study and the production sequence uh, for the references. But um, if I uh, study the methods, in, for example, like Pong Beng nowadays, they uh, produce the new ceramic, um, uh, it may not give us a very good uh, references. But uh, what I'm looking about is about the, po uh, the potter's choices. Because I, I don't think that in the ancient time with NGOs, but for me, I will think about how foreign uh, uh, impact uh, on the potters, they can tell us um, uh, the conservatism. Yeah, this is what uh, I learned it from um, the ceramic theories. So I hope that I can answer your question. Yeah, it's one of the methods, but not the, not the major one, because we have enough archaeological evidence and uh, uh, historical tests and other methods will help us. And uh, because today um, of the time limit, I cannot um, show you our preliminary findings on uh, the archaeometry and um, the findings uh, compared with uh, the composition between Chinese ceramics and Khmer ceramics. So I hope that I can uh, answer your question. And thank you so much. A very good question uh, from you and Tom. So, to so Tom, um, did I answer your question? Or yes, you excellent. Thanks so much. Questions? Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Um, can I actually follow up with another question? Yeah, Sorry sure. if I'm sounds very dominating yeah. in the conversation. Hi, Tai Chu. Nice to meet you. Yeah, my other colleagues in, uh, from uh, Phnom Penh. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, sure. yeah, so you mentioned about uh, technological choice, and I think uh, you call uh, La Marmiette, I think the French uh, scholar, is on, uh, he has a collection. Uh, on technological choices. And I'm actually very curious on the technological choices that you talk about here. So part of his theory is that people choose certain technology, not necessarily because it's the best, um, not necessarily because it fits the best, but very often you have to look at the symbolic side of whole things. And therefore you choose the one that sort of makes sense. Right, that's part of the things that make sense to you. Um, so in that sense, I actually quite buy that whole idea about why they, you know, there's only certain part of the technologies that they want to adopt from the Chinese way of making porcelain, but they don't want other ways because mm -hmm. that, yes, there are a whole symbolic system that they, that they are embedded in and they need to make the choice within that field of uh, choices. However, I also wonder about the, a little bit more of the technicality side of the story, which I don't know whether uh, it's possible to answer based on um, the ma uh, materials uh, there. So what kind of techniques that we are talking about in terms of making porcelain here? I think, is it from your, I think maybe from your previous talk that I've been to or some another talk, I think you guys make a different a, a distinction between different kind of porcelain or different kind of pottery, right? Mm -hmm. Stoneware, it depends on the uh, temperature, right? Some temperatures higher, some temperatures lower, and obviously the control of temperature uh, requires a lot of techniques, different kind of materials, different kind of techniques to control the temperature. You have to build the kills. But also, for example, if you really want to make the kind of a fine porcelain, really the China, China kind, you need to have the specific, uh, 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 what, soil, a uh, uh, coling, coling, in order to make that porcelain because you have to reach a really high degree of temperature. So my question is really on that part. What kind of technique that we can, we know that might be actually adapted, adopted from the Chinese side? Are we talking about, you know, the control of fire, the use of certain materials in making the, the, the kills? It, what ways can we actually trace this kind of a technological transfer? And more specifically, I think this is probably the most difficult part is who may be the people that brings those knowledge and skills and techniques from China to Cambodia. 
if we are thinking about just flow of good, goods, most likely we are talking about merchants. Merchants don't know, didn't know how to make those things. You probably need craftsmen, craftsmanship to do that, unless you have reverse engineering skills. But I'm not sure that exists or that could actually be made in the context, or maybe it, it did. Okay, thank you, uh, Zhang Jin, for your question. So I want to emphasize that if you uh, did attend my talk in uh, Hong Kong Anthropological Society or even Friday seminar, it's about six, six years ago, I think. Yeah, okay. so yeah, you, you can see we newly published <laughs> many new articles. So we, uh, we have more refinement on um, the such articles. But uh, uh, for the first question, I think that is very good question for us to think about. Uh, for the Khmer people, uh, what do you mean by the best? People, because uh, when I mentioned about um, uh, the concept on the social and technological uh, choices by Le Monnier or other people like uh, Gaucher and many uh, previous researchers, actually we are not talking about the best. What do you mean by mm -hmm. best? For Chinese, they think that is the best, but for it may not fit into uh, the Cambodian uh, context. So what we are looking for is the extensive social and environmental context of the local perception and why they borrow it in the specific area, why they use it, because uh, obviously they produce a lot of copper boxes rather than bowls in the Korean area. But uh, for the Chinese, because of uh, different habits on eating uh, food or drinking, they use different uh, utensils. So comparatively, they produce more bowls for the local consumption. And more important is about the mixture on the conservatism and also the change in the um, technical system. But I want to emphasize that um, for the symbolic meaning um, in the technological choices, I think that is not uh, really a, a very crucial factor. And you can see that actually uh, when we study about that is uh, quite complicated. Uh, for example, like this uh, modified model uh, by um, the scholar from the UCL, uh, you can see that they care about the context, the whole sequence on the production, distribution, um, the property, and um, also uh, the consumption and the performance on characteristics. They should care about the environments um, they are in. So this is not necessarily um, create a claim totally same as Chinese, because actually the situation and uh, the environment is an other story. And so this is the first thing I want to emphasize. And the second, when you ask about uh, the, uh, the categorizations uh, between ceramics, uh, yeah, uh, and, and I highly appreciate you uh, uh, pay attention to my talk. Yeah, we will divide it into uh, three categories, uh, the earthenware, uh, the stoneware, and uh, the porcelain. And uh, especially when you talk about the coal lin, um, it's not just uh, uh, only care about the um, material, but we also care about the firing temperature. And as I mentioned that uh, for the earthenware production, for example, like the place in Kambochinan, actually they may not use the kiln. They can use the open firing to fire uh, the uh, earthenware and the firing temperature is quite low. And also the porosity of the earthenware is comparatively uh, higher than uh, the porcelain. Uh, produced in China, especially in the blue and white porcelain that is, is very well known um, uh, since the Yuan period to uh, the Qing period. So this is an uh, other things when we talk about um, the material, we, we may take care about that. And another question when you mentioned about, I, I think that is very good, it's about um, who bought this technology um, to uh, Cambodia and how did they exchange that? Um, there is many, many uh, possibility, even for the merchants, because I always mention that for the society is so complex. That's why I use if no archaeological method to interview many peoples. I can tell you many merchants, uh, they can have different roles, even for the porters. The porters can be the porters, but they may not be a specialized porters. For example, in the situation in Cambodia, they can be the farmer. Okay, because they have wet season and also dry season, so they can have different role. They can be the potters, they can, at the same time, they can be the farmer, but they can be the worshiper, the Buddhist worshippers. So when we think about that, don't just stereotype the person only have one role. 
And besides the merchants, uh, we have Kamen monks. Um, they have some records. Actually, they went to Guangzhou in um, the Sixth Dynasty to study the manuscript and uh, have pitching uh, for the Chinese people in uh, the Guangzhou ports. And also for the craftsmen, uh, because especially for the archaeological evidence and even for the uh, Chinese texts, we seldom have this information um, to talk about the exchange between the craftsmen. But at least, uh, for example, in the Japanese case, we obviously they have diplomats and they have um, the exchange students from Japan to China, and they um, directly learn the uh, craftsmanship, for example, like the architecture and also the production uh, skills on ceramics, and they brought it back to Japan. But uh, obviously, they did not um, borrow all the or under the so-called Chinese infant uh, in every aspect and then uh, brought it back to Japan and then produced their own ceramics. So um, the same, when we study um, the relationship between Cambodia and China, we may think more um, broadly about different roles of different people. Even for Chou Ta Kwan, he can be the diplomat, but at the same time, he can be a very good citizen uh, staying in Cambodia and then um, he had have a chance to uh, record what he saw and um, visit it. But I, I agree that um, if you want to have a more sophisticated uh, exchange, especially on the technology, uh, it's good to have craftsmen or uh, uh, the official. They are specializing on uh, the craftsmanship. So that's why when I mentioned in the Song Hui Yao Zi Gao, it's a very important test for us to understand um, their relationship uh, between the officials. Maybe some there were some more officials. I'm trying to find more tests between the inscription and also um, the Chinese text. I hope I can f find more evidence on that. But uh, right now, at least we know that uh, for uh, Khmer, we have Khmer merchants, uh, diplomats, monks, um, the diasporas from uh, Cambodia, they uh, visit China is quite often late. So uh, I believe that um, maybe some of them uh, can be the porters and then they have some exchange in particular um, in uh, the Zhejiang area and the port area in Guangzhou and also Chengzhou. So I hope that I can uh, answer your uh, question. So just think about the role of the people. Can yeah, be but then there are people. merchants can I mean, yes, uh, merchants can be a, a, a farmers at the same time if there's because but, uh, they also have the diaspora. So I mean, uh, they have they have different different roles and uh, they can um, uh, transmit uh, their knowledge through uh, writing books. Because during the Song period, uh, is uh, they have a very uh, um, a development on the printing uh, technology in Song period. So bear in mind on that. And I also mentioned it in uh, my uh, forthcoming uh, journal article. I uh, used the material from the Song period. They uh, talk about the architectural uh, methodology in uh, China. They have a detailed records on that. So um, yeah, that, that's good for us. But uh, for the uh, archaeological findings and even for the test mentioned, it's too little for us to make any conclusion on that. But I can just tell you, uh, maybe they have some Chinese diaspora they reside in Encore, maybe they um, know uh, they were the porters from mainland China. Because uh, when I compare with um, the contemporary evidence in um, Singapore, there's quite popular, they have Taju and also the, uh, um, the Hokkien people, they um, move to uh, Vietnam, for example, like in uh, Hu Xi Minh city, they bought their technology directly from uh, Xuan to um, the Hu Chi Minh city, or even for the Fujian people, when they um, move to Singapore and Malaysia, they keep on using the dragon kiln for firing. But obviously from the kiln structure, I think that uh, the Khmer people um, develop their own uh, production method by themselves, rather than uh, using the, chi the Chinese um, kiln method. But I, I admit that for uh, topological study, for example, like the decorative method and also uh, the forms, maybe they borrow some, but I, I think that they also have their own um, own tradition. This is my uh, observation, but uh, thank you very much for, um, John, your question. Yeah, I agree on that. And my point is just this one possibility is why they do not adopt it. It's actually certain part of the technology was actually not being transmitted to other contexts. 
for various um, reasons. Uh, as I mentioned in the theoretical film, I already mentioned that I will not uh, repeat on it. It's based on uh, at least from, from this, at least has three aspects. The social and environmental context and um, the technological uh, features and also uh, the change in the technological systems and many factors affecting people not accepting uh, or it's, it's impossible to accept everything because the um, the social economic context is totally different. No, no, I'm not talking about why they're not adopting. I'm just saying that there's one possibility. Actually, this is against the Chinese government's argument is to say that maybe part of the technology never got shipped outside, never got exported outside at that particular period. That's my point. Oh, because of course. Because you do not have course, that's true. To... It, You know, there are so many uh, Chinese kilns in mainland China. Yeah, even in Chenzhou and even in Zhejiang, there's a, there's a lot of technology, but it depends on the uh, Chinese diaspora and the group of you. Hi, Sofandi. Hello. <laughs> nice to meet you. And, and I in particularly want to mention these two points. It's about the population pressures and also the um, medium of exchange on the climate policy, on the diplomatic and economic relationship with China. It's impossible to borrow everything from China because there are so many different uh, ceramic production systems in mainland China and not all the uh, ceramic production in China are for the export purpose. This is what I want to emphasize about that. Yeah, I hope that I can answer. And, and yeah. other yeah, I was going to say that uh, we, we, I was just going to say we have a little more than 10 minutes left officially. If anybody else, I see that we have about 24 participants, which is uh, gratifying. Yes. Um, sure. Anybody else want to, to, to join in? Yes. And uh, Tai Chun, are you talking something? Yeah, I, I find some of my colleagues, my Cambodian colleagues are here. Ah, so, very good. Yeah, very good. I, I would uh, like to invite them to uh, say something. Some of them are based in uh, Phnom Penh and... Um, uh, and also some of them based in uh, Samuel. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a real advantage of Zoom. We can have a yes, true global, yes, global yes, seminar, yes. That's fantastic, yeah. Yeah, I really want to get back to Cambodia, but you know, <laughs> for the <laughs> quarantine. <laughs> Diffic yes, diff uh, difficult for a uh, field field research at the moment, isn't it? It's, uh, yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. One has to be, uh, one has yeah. to go through what has what, what done in the past. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, Wang Chunan, do you want to say something? Yeah, about the question? Yeah, let's see whether he's here. Yeah. Okay, maybe they have a difficulty to use the mic. But anyway, you um, can uh, type, it, type, type it in... Uh, in the chat box, maybe you can type in. Yeah, or he's yeah, he's yeah. muted. He needs to unmute himself, like I just yeah. unmuted myself. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> he, he's trying to say something, but yeah, we can't. Yeah, obviously he's trying to say something, but I cannot hear him. I don't know why. Hello, Theron. Yes, Rachel. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, it's good yeah, time for you to share. Yeah, yeah. Interesting uh, presentation. I am agree with your uh, answer to the participation. And it's really clear that, uh, for example, if we think about the technology, we had to consider that uh, from prehistoric or Iron Age, Khmer already has their technology to create those earthenware. Mm -hmm. And actually, we know that uh, we have the uh, Kuti production at Jiang Ai that led to the 15th, or 16th century, uh, 5th, 5th to 6th century. So it means we already know some of the technology also production. Yes, just that's all. Mm, yeah, thank you, Rachna. Yeah, um, especially in Zhongai, uh, maybe some of you know that uh, it, here is a very important uh, ceramic production site uh, near the Tulang Hills. Yes, and um, previously, um, uh, uh, Mr. Poon Kazaka and uh, with uh, the people from the uh, uh, National University of Singapore and also the ISIS uh, from Singapore, they also have collaborated collaborative uh, excavation together and then they find um, the earthenware sites there, yeah. Thank you for watching this uh, information on that. Does anybody else want to join the discussion? Yeah, they're quite, quite shy. <laughs> Yeah. 
if um, if anybody does have any questions, um, of course, uh, Sharon, I'm sure they can contact you by uh, email. Um, yeah, sure. Or um, you're, you're, you're uh, easy to find at your uh, Chinese university website. Um, I, I want to just, again, thank you for, for taking the time. I um, want to thank my colleagues for, for uh, the interesting questions, colleagues also in Cambodia. Uh, and, um, you know, to, to, to thank you for uh, making that uh, uh, journey, uh, virtual journey from, from, uh, from, from north of City University of Hong Kong to, to join us here. And uh, also to, uh, to, to also say, Sharon, that, uh, you know, the one thing we, uh, we, we're, we're trying to do and, and one thing that uh, if, if you can talk to any other colleagues who are working on Southeast Asia in Hong Kong to, uh, to, to be sure to let us know. We try to track everybody down, but sometimes we miss somebody uh, because, I mean, the one thing about Hong Kong is there are, for, for the size of the city, quite a few large universities and uh, uh, one does find people working on Southeast Asia, even though uh, it seems like uh, it's overwhelmed by uh, China studies, of course. But uh, yes, <laughs> but uh, th there are uh, there. It's it's been fascinating, and and we of course try as a center to to bring together Southeast Asian studies, not just uh, in our own university, but in all Hong Kong universities and of course beyond. So again, many many thanks for that. Thanks to our audience for joining us. Uh, again, a reminder that. Uh, we have a talk on a contemporary topic on, um, on uh, uh, the situation in the Philippines on the uh, so-called war on drugs uh, by, interestingly, a Singapore connection again, uh, Dr. Sol Iglesias, who just did her PhD at, at NUS. So we can see there the travel bubble or not there, NUS remains a, a major center of uh, the academic study of Southeast Asia. That's on the 8th of March, uh, also at the same time, four o'clock. So please do join us for that. Uh, all that remains is to thank you again, Sharon, uh, for this fascinating talk. Uh, and uh, we hope to uh, have a chance to uh, hear from you again soon. And uh, Mark, uh, I can see Tai Chun, uh, he, um, he uh, uh, say hi. I, I just wondering, he may have a question. And uh, uh, I, I have already put my email in the chat box. So just in case you have further uh, questions related to this talk, um, you can um, uh, contact me by this email. And I think, yeah, uh, I think Tai Chun was muted. Uh, maybe Mark, can you allow him to? I am actually not the host. Uh, the host is, I'm not sure if Angel is still with Yeah, him. I think Angel is the host. But yeah. I think that actually they can turn on the My Light webinar. Yeah. And even from if, John if you can hear us, Angel, the, if we can turn on his mic, if you, because there's a problem with that. Yeah, or oh. Tai Chun, you can type your the question. Participants and need to unmute themselves. Ah, uh, they need to unmute themselves. Yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, okay. So uh, we we can provide the influence, but 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 uh, muting is localized. Yes. Uh, and everybody has to, the... to make to to make their own unmuting in in that sense. So. Yes. Okay. Um, again, uh, many thanks and uh, thanks to our audience again. And, and we hope to see you all soon in this small but uh, growing group of uh, those uh, interested in the academic study of Southeast Asia. Thanks. Thanks again, Sharon, and, and hope to see you again soon. Yeah, thank you. In, 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 in person, hopefully next time. <laughs> yeah, Tai Chun, you can email me Yeah, if you have any question uh, about that. And thank you very much for Mark and Diego, and uh, thank you, Southeast Asia Research Center, CTU, for the invitation. So, thank our, you. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. Yeah. Goodbye. Thank you, thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you. Yeah.